Good morning. Welcome to Emmanuel Church Chichester and our Sunday YouTube service. For those of you that this is your first time at Emmanuel, it's great to be with us. Thank you for joining us. My name is Paul and I'm one of the leaders here at Emmanuel Church and I'm going to be leading the service today. Now, uh, like many churches, we are adapting to this new way of doing things. Uh, and a lot of activities are continuing, but it, on a virtual format. All the information for our life groups, our prayer meetings, everything that's happening can be found on our website, which is www.emmanuelchichester.com. Now, the government have changed uh, uh, and released the churches into uh, being able to gather in their usual ways. Now, we're going to continue with our 10 o'clock YouTube services for a while yet, but Today, this afternoon at half past four, we're going to be gathering at Central School uh, for a communion service. If you would like to join us, you do need to book because obviously spaces are limited due to uh, social distancing. Uh, if you want to book a place, you need to head over to our website and the information can be found there how to book a place. It's going to be uh, half past four, a communion service. We're going to record it and, and that will be put onto our YouTube channel as well. So you'll be able to watch it later if you can't actually join us. If you are coming along, uh, why, you may want to bring a face mask with you because you might feel more comfortable whilst wearing them. They're not compulsory, but are advisory at this stage. As we start our service, your week may have been as busy as mine. You may be feeling a little bit overrun with everything. Your brain may be running at you know, 60 miles an hour. And you just need to calm down and centre yourself. I know I feel like that quite often when I, I come to church. My brain is buzzing. So let's just stop. Be still. And wait on the Lord as we start our service. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come and fill this place. Fill wherever we are this morning, our front rooms, our living rooms, our bed bedrooms, wherever we are watching this. F meet with us, we pray. Come and inhabit this place as well as refreshing and renewing us this morning with your life-giving living water that you promised. Come we pray. Help us to put aside those things that are just distracting from focusing on you this morning so that we can look to you. And Father, we pray that those things in our lives that are just acting as a barrier between us and you, those things that we've done wrong, the things where we've chosen to walk our own way and not yours, pray that you would forgive us. Father, we thank you that through the death of your son, the price was paid. We are forgiven people. And may we, as we enter into this, the rest of this worship together, worship as forgiven people, restored people, people welcomed back into your loving arms, to the relationship that we, we were created for. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Did I 
restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath.
There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down. Shadow, you won't light up. Mountain, you won't climb up. Coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down. Lie, you won't tear down. Coming after me. There's no shadow. We believe at Emmanuel that when we pray, situations change and our, our, our actual reality is altered because God gets involved in the situation. That's why God asks us to pray for things, because he wants us, he wants us to be involved. He wants to be involved in our situation and he wants us to be involved in his work. And so prayer is a two-way conversation of us getting involved in his work and him getting involved in, 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 in our lives. And we cry out to him to, that he will change situations. 
So we're going to hand over to uh, Josh this morning, who's going to lead us in our time of intercessions. This week, I thought it would be worth having some semi-structured meditative prayer. A song will play with words and images. Use this as you want to help you in your time of prayer, to praise, thank, petition, or say sorry.
Thank you, Josh. Well, if you've been with us for a while now, you'll be realising that we've been journeying through the book of Nehemiah and Nehemiah finally comes to the conclusion today. And James is going to be speaking to us in a moment uh, as we look at the final chapter of Nehemiah. But let me tell you, uh, as from next week, we're going to be starting a new sermon series. So here's a piece of breaking news. In John's Gospel, at the end of John's Gospel, he says that, uh, that he hasn't included everything he saw Jesus do because there aren't enough pages to write it all down. John says, says it's so much to record, I can't possibly do it. But I've written these signs that you would know that Jesus is the Son of God. And in John's Gospel, we see seven signs that point to who Jesus is. So we're going to be looking at the seven signs in John's Gospel over these coming weeks. So that's starting next week. We really hope that you're going to get on board and uh, engage with these seven signs in John's Gospels. But today... We come to the, the finale, the, 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 the pinnacle of the book of Nehemiah. And James is going to be speaking to us. But first, Mark is going to read to us the final chapter of the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah 13, from the New International Version. On that day, the book of Moses was read aloud in the hearing of the people. And there it was found written that no Ammonite or Maavite should ever be admitted into the assembly of God, because they had not met the Israelites with food and water, but had hired Balaam to call a curse down on them. Our God, however, turned that curse into a blessing. When the people heard this law, they excluded from Israel all who were of foreign descent. Before this, Elishab, the priest had been put in charge of the storerooms of the house of our God. He was closely associated with Tobiah and he had provided him with a large room formerly used to store the grain offerings and incense and temple articles and also the articles of grain and new wine and olive oil prescribed for the Levites, musicians and gatekeepers as well as contributions for the priests. But while all this was going on I was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of Arxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. Sometime later I asked his permission and came back to Jerusalem. Here I learned about the evil that Elishib had done in providing Tobiah a room in the courts of the house of God. I was greatly displeased and threw Tobiah's household goods out of the room. I gave orders to purify the rooms and then I put back in them the equipment of the house of God with the grain offerings and the incense. I also learned that portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them and that all the Levites and musicians responsible for the service had gone back to their own fields. So I rebuked the officials and asked them, why is the house of God neglected? Then I called them together and stationed them at their posts. All Judea brought tithes of grain, new wine and olive oil into the storerooms. I put Shelmiah, the priest, Zadok the scribe and the Levite named Pidia in charge of the storerooms and made Hanan, son of Zakur, the son of Mataniah, their assistant because they were considered trustworthy. They were made responsible for distributing the supplies to their fellow Levites. Remember me for this, my God, and do not blot out what I, also, I have so faithfully done for the house of my God and its services. In those days I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in grain, loading it on donkeys, together with wine, grapes, figs and all other kinds of loads. And they were bringing all this into Jerusalem on the Sabbath. Therefore I warned them against selling food on that day. People from Tyre who lived in Jerusalem were bringing them in fish and all kinds of merchandise and selling them in Jerusalem on the Sabbath to the people of Judah. I rebuked the nobles of Judah and said to them, What is this wicked thing you are doing? Desecrating the Sabbath day! Didn't our ancestors do the same thing so that our God brought all this calamity on us? and on this city? 
And now you're stirring up more wrath against Israel by desecrating the Sabbath. When evening shadows fell on the, <coughs> on the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I ordered the doors to be shut and not opened until the Sabbath day was over. I stationed some of my own men at the gates so that no load could be brought in on the Sabbath day. Once or twice the merchants and sellers of all kinds of goods spent the night outside Jerusalem. But I warned them and said, Why do you spend the night by the wall? If you do this again, I'll arrest you. From that time on, they no longer came to the Sabbath, on the Sabbath. When I commanded the Levites to purify, then I commanded the Levites to purify themselves and go and guard the gates in order to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember me also, my God, and show mercy to me according to your great love. Moreover, in those days I saw men of Judah who had married women of Ashdod, Amon, and Moab. Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod or the language of one of the other peoples, and did not know how to speak the language of Judah. I rebuked them and called curses down on them. I beat some of the men and pulled out their hair. I made them take an oath in God's name and said, You are not to give your daughters in marriage to their sons, nor are you to take their daughters in marriage for your sons, or for yourselves. Was it not because of marriages like these that Solomon, king of Israel, sinned? Among the many nations there was no king like him. He was loved by his God and God made him king over Israel. But even he was led to sin by foreign women. Must we hear now that you too are doing all this terrible wickedness and being unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women? One of the sons of Jehoiada son of Elishib, the high priest, was son-in-law to Sanballat, the Haranite, and I drove him away from me. Remember them, my God, because they defiled the priestly office, the covenant of the priesthood and of the Levites. So I purified the priests and Levites of everything foreign and assigned them duties, each to his own task. They also made provision for the contributions of wood at designated times and for the first fruits. Remember me with favour, my God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Mark. As James comes to speak, I pray that your hearts and my heart will be open not to hear James's voice, but to hear the Lord speaking through James and ultimately that our lives will be changed because the Lord has spoken to us this morning. So if that's your prayer, just say Amen now as we hand over to James. Today we are finishing our series in the book of Nehemiah, looking at chapter 13. And there's real honesty in the way that the book finishes. Most literature and the majority of films finish on a high, the story all resolved and a happily ever after ending. And this could have been the case with Nehemiah. He could have ended his book with chapter 12 on a high with the joyous dedication of the wall, looking forward to that fairy tale ending. But rather than leave the reader to celebrate, Nehemiah goes on in chapter 13 to address some of the continuing struggles. Although much of this chapter is not directly applicable to the Christian life as it stands, the human heart does not change. And so there are consequently things that we can learn today. And as we dig deeper into the chapter, we're going to be looking at three things. The situation that Nehemiah was facing, the quantum shift from the Old Testament, from the Old Covenant to the New, and the lessons that we could learn. Uh, I'm afraid uh, that I wasn't able to think of three points, all beginning with the same letter, um, but put together they spell SQL, S-Q-L, the situation, the quantum leap, and the lessons we can learn. So first, Nehemiah's situation. After approximately 12 years as governor, we learn in verse 6 uh, that Nehemiah returned to the royal court in Babylon. And rather tantalisingly, he tells us, 
virtually nothing about this. We don't know if his term of government had ended or if he was on a kind of regular leave of absence. We don't know how long he was away or if he was ever expected to return. But the fact that he needs to ask permission to return in verse 6 suggests that his second visit was not originally planned. It may be that he'd received news of developments in Jerusalem that caused him disquiet. And that's exactly uh, what he finds. And on his arrival, swift, stern action was required on four fronts. The purity of the temple, people's failure to tithe and the consequent neglect of the temple, observance of the Sabbath and intermarriage with surrounding nations. And verses one to nine are concerned primarily with the purity of the temple and with Tobiah in particular. Now you'll remember Tobiah from his opposition to Nehemiah earlier in the book, and it's likely that his aim was to water down the religious and cultural uniqueness of the Jewish people so that he could increase his power over them in the region. Elijah was probably a temple functionary who was associated with Tobiah and helped to forward his ambitions. To this end, he gave Tobiah a large room in the temple. Now, Tobiah's ancestry as an Ammonite was well known and his presence in the temple flouted Jewish law. Even more shocking, the room he was allowed to use had previously been used to store the grain offerings and tithes for the Levites. And uh, on Nehemiah's return, he acts directly, throwing out to buy stuff, purifying the rooms and returning them to their original purpose. And it's, probably that, it's probable that Tobiah's occupation of these rooms is directly connected to the next issue that Nehemiah faced. Unlike the priests who had access to food from the sacrifices, the Levites were totally dependent on tithes um, for their sustenance. And when they ceased, they were obliged to go and look elsewhere for the necessities of life. And consequently, the, they left the temple and the house of God was neglected. And again, Nehemiah reacted in characteristic style, rebuking the officials responsible and carefully choosing new people to oversee the storage and equitable distribution of the tithes. The next issue that Nehemiah faced was observance of the Sabbath. Now, this was not uh, a new issue. It was something that Amos had addressed 300 years before. But amongst other things, it seems that Jews living outside Jerusalem were collecting and transporting goods on the Sabbath ready for market. It may be that they felt the ban on them working on the Sabbath gave non-Jews living in the province a commercial advantage. And Nehemiah delivered a formal warning and took practical steps to ensure that it was not worth the merchants setting out for Jerusalem before the end of the Sabbath. He shut the gates. He had them guarded by his own personal people. He threatened arrest to those who waited outside the walls while the gates were shut. And following what happened to Tobiah, there may be a note of dry humour in his conclusion that from that time on, they no longer came on the Sabbath. And then finally, Nehemiah tackles intermarriage with women from surrounding nations. And again, this was a recurring issue. Ezra had addressed it not long before, but he'd obviously been unable to settle the problem permanently. And it was not only the marriages themselves, but half the children of these marriages were unable to understand Hebrew. And Nehemiah was shocked by this because language was one of the major things that distinguished and sustained the Jewish people. And it was key to their ability to read scripture. Not only this, but one of the high priest Eliashib's grandsons had married a daughter of Sanballat. Like Tobiah, Sanballat was another foreigner who opposed Nehemiah on his first arrival. And such a blatant disregard for the law within the high priestly family was unbelievable. And Nehemiah had no hesitation in banishing the culprit who probably went to live in his bride's home in Samaria. Nehemiah further hoped to contain the problem by making the people swear not to be party to any further marriages of this sort. Now, Nehemiah's responses in this chapter may seem harsh to us two and a half thousand years later on, but we need to understand the context. To the Jewish people, the exile in Babylon was the most calamitous thing. 
They were forcibly removed from the land that God had given them and the holy city Jerusalem was destroyed by fire. And why? It was all because of disobedience. It's therefore understandable that Nehemiah reacts strongly when he sees that same disobedience beginning to creep in again. And we see clearly in verse 18 that he was determined that history would not repeat itself. Didn't your ancestors do the same things so that our God brought all this calamity on us and our city? Now you are stirring up more wrath against Israel. Nehemiah was a man whose heart was fully after God. He had the best of motivations. He was simply trying to keep the people pure and therefore safe. But he did not have Jesus. And I know the phrase, uh, what would Jesus do, uh, is not terribly in vogue at the moment. But I think uh, we can safely say that what Nehemiah did was not what Jesus would do. He didn't understand Jesus. And it's really important for us um, to comprehend the quantum shift that took place when Jesus lived, died and rose again. Because the old covenant was an external covenant in which the people of God were ruled by law. And the people had to obey the rules to stay safe. And in pursuit of this laudable goal, Nehemiah felt it was acceptable to rebuke people, to call curses down on them, to beat them and to pull out their hair. Verse 25. But we, we live under a new covenant. This is an, an internal covenant written on our hearts. And on the cross, Jesus took the punishment for sin to enable us to come back into intimate relationship with the God who created us and who loves us beyond our understanding. Jesus removed the need for fear in our relationship with God. But sin destroys our intimacy with God and it hurts those that we love the most. And instead of law and punishment of the old covenant, in the new covenant, we need to learn to choose not to sin in order to protect our intimacy with God and our relationships with one another. It's impossible to walk in intimate relationship with God if we're disobedient to his commands. Basically, the Lord says to us, if you love me, you will protect our relationship. You will choose not to do things that are wrong. And we mustn't default back into old covenant thinking or old covenant living, or we will approach sin like Nehemiah did with fear and punishment and not like Jesus with love and the power to be renewed from the inside out. So not only uh, does Nehemiah 13 not end with a fairy tale, but he draws a stark contrast between the old and new covenants. And in doing so, it contains some practical lessons for us. In particular, that there are both internal and external requirements for a thriving spiritual life. So it's gonna look at the, oh, my last point, the lessons that we can learn. So we looked at the situation, we looked at the quantum leap, and now the lessons. And the first, is the internal requirements for a thriving spiritual life. We live under the new covenant. We don't need to fear. We don't need to strive. But we do need to love God. We do need to press into him and to pursue him. The Father has declared that he will be found by us if we seek him with all our hearts. Jacob wrestled with an angel and would not let go until he was blessed. Elisha would not let Elijah out of his sight until he'd received a double portion. And we see at the end of Nehemiah chapter 12, wonderful worship, tithes and offerings being regularly given, a delight in those who ministered and praise and thanksgiving, uh, uh, you know, similar to that at the very high point of Israel's history. But by chapter 13, the joy seems to have dissipated. And if your heart has gone cold, if, you'd want, if you've wandered from the path, I would encourage you to go back to where your heart was warm and ask God to meet you again. Go where God is and set up an ambush for him. Wrestle with him. Hold on and refuse to let go. Don't let him out of your sight. 
Because in the world, we get thirsty by not drinking. But the kingdom of God is all upside down. You live by dying. You're exalted by going low. You receive by giving. And in the kingdom of God, you get thirsty for God by drinking more of him. And Father God asks us to love him, to get out of our busy routines, to pursue him, to wait on him, to rest in him. This is an affair of the heart. It's all about relationship. But if there's one thing that we, can, we learn from Nehemiah in this chapter, it is the importance of putting structures in place to help to sustain our spiritual life. And as Nehemiah faces every one of the things in this chapter, he takes practical steps uh, to put them right. And Father God loves each of us. He keeps us in his care. But our wholehearted commitment to God is unlikely to be sustained if it doesn't have a properly maintained framework through which it can develop and bear fruit. Now, clearly, external systems are inadequate in themselves, particularly if they're imposed on us by others from without. You know, they can quickly wither and lose their efficacy, as was the case here in Nehemiah. We need ourselves to put in place rhythms of spiritual life that work for us, making time to be with the Father. And I love uh, this little way um, of thinking about it, um, that we can divert daily, withdraw weekly and abandon annually. Just spending a small amount of time each day reading the Bible and praying will provide food for our spiritual life. And once a week, maybe spending slightly longer withdrawing to be with God, maybe spending time uh, putting on worship music and simply soaking in his presence and abandoning annually, maybe going away on a retreat once a year uh, to spend some more extended time meditating on scripture and waiting in the Lord's presence. But it's not only about the things that we do ourselves, putting practices in place that help to draw people around us so that we can support one another mutually. Maybe that's at church, through life groups, in accountable relationships, so that we can help one another to stay on fire for the living God. So there are both internal heart things and external practical things that we need to put in place if we want to keep ourselves spiritually alive for the long term. Now the book of Nehemiah finishes on an uncertain note and I find that so encouraging because our lives aren't always lived on the mountain tops. Our lives aren't always lived in the great times of worship and celebration and dedication that we see in chapter 12. There are times in our lives when we struggle, when it seems that there are endless things one after another, after another, after another, and that we have to contend with. And uh, reading through the Bible in a year, um, one of the one of the, the thoughts that Nicky Gumbel does, he talks about battles and blessings. And, and I think so often we think um, that there will be times of battle and times of blessing. But he makes the point that often uh, these two tracks run in parallel, that there will be areas of battle in our lives and areas of blessing in our lives at the same time. And we need uh, to hold on through the battles and, and pressing in for the blessings. And uh, that's one of the reasons I love the fact that this book doesn't go out on a high. It's so real. And um, you know, the fairy tale ending is when we get to be with Jesus in heaven. Until that time, we will have um, to hold on um, through the difficult times. We'll have to deal with the things that come against us. And Nehemiah shows us how we can do that, keeping our hearts on fire for God and putting practical things in place to, restate, to sustain us. So when Nehemiah returned from Babylon, he had to deal with impurity in the temple. He had to deal with the people's um, failure to tithe and the consequent neglect of the temple, the failure to observe the Sabbath and intermarriage with surrounding nations. There were all these issues. And in the face of the fickleness of the people, he reminds the Lord of his own continuing faithfulness. And although his methods may seem harsh and dictatorial to us, Nehemiah not only stayed on fire for God, but he helped those around him to do the same as best he could. And we have the benefit of having seen God in Jesus living on earth. 
We have the benefit of the Holy Spirit living inside each one of us. But may we be as diligent as Nehemiah at putting structures in place to sustain our spiritual life, to keep the same fire of love in our hearts. And maybe then, like Nehemiah, we will also be able to inspire those around us to come to know our loving Heavenly Father and to press deeper into him, to overflow with Father God, to overflow with his love, to impact those around us and maybe to change the course of an individual, a family, a community, a nation. May we pray. If you have felt at the joy of your salvation waning, we have an opportunity to come to the Father now. He loves you so much. He loves you more than you can imagine. His door is always open. And um, as we close today, I just want to give each of us a moment of quiet to do business with the Lord in our own hearts. And it may be that you need uh, to come back to the Lord today to ask him to refresh you, to ask him to rekindle the fire of his love in your heart today. And if that fire is waning, there's no condemnation. The Lord loves you. You know, we're a new covenant people. We don't live under law and punishment and guilt and shame. We live in love and freedom. And the Lord wants us to choose to run into his embrace, even as the prodigal son did. Or it may be and that we need to ask the Lord what structures, what practical things he would like us to put in place in our lives to revive and to sustain our spiritual life. So we're going to wait on the Lord and I'd encourage you to return to him with all your heart if that's what you need to do. I'd encourage you to listen to him and ask um, if there are structures that you need to put in place to stay um, on fire for him, not just now, but into the future. May we pray together. Father God, thank you that you love us more than we know. And I ask, Father, that you would fill each of us again with the power of your Holy Spirit today. Let's just wait on the Lord together. And Father, if we've walked away from you, if our hearts have gone cold, we say, Lord Jesus, we're so sorry. And you may just want to choose to return to the Lord today. To ask him to meet you, to fill you again with his love, with his spirit, to set you ablaze. And Father, I just ask that you would show us if there are any structures you want us to put in place. To sustain and to grow our spiritual lives. Just speak to us now, I pray. And I pray, Lord, that as you fill us with the fire of your love today, that we might overflow with that fire and love to those around us, that like Nehemiah, we might shape the destinies of people, of families, of communities, of our city. Lord, might we put courage in those around us to stay on fire for Jesus, to put structures of their own in place for your glory, Lord God Almighty. Amen. Thank you, James. Uh, thank you for finishing up the book of Nehemiah for us this morning. Now, normally after church, we would offer you prayer ministry where we would gather around those people that want for prayer.
prayer for anything, but if God's spoken them during the service or perhaps that the, the, they've, they've got stuff going on in their lives that they want prayer for, then we call them forward at the end of the service to pray for them. Obviously that can't happen in its usual format. But after, as soon as the service finishes, we've got a Zoom code. If you wanna join for prayer ministry after service, if you want people to stand alongside you and pray with you, then the Zoom code can be found on our website. Head over to there, you'll find the Zoom code straight after the service finishes. There'll be a team of people there who will welcome you and they will pray with you. Now, don't worry, it's not gonna be a public thing. You'll be broken into a small breakout room with someone, one or two people who will just listen to what you want prayer for and then pray for you. Uh, if that's not you, that's not the position you find yourself in this morning, but you wanna gather with us as we do after our normal Sunday services for fellowship, for coffee after church, then there's a different Zoom code for that. That can be found also on our website. We would love to, uh, to see you after church. That's five minutes after the service finishes. We're gonna be gathering on Zoom for coffee after church. Uh, I hope that I will see some of you a little bit later at the, the uh, communion service. If not, you may want to join with us, join us on YouTube, and that will be great. But I pray that God's blessing will fall upon you now, that you will know his peace, that you will know his presence and his blessing on your life. The blessing of God Almighty, who is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. May that be upon you now and always. Amen.